that we understand our existence primarily through metaphors and uh, I think it's crucial that we become aware of our metaphors. Um, I've often found myself, as Kirk just used, uh, the metaphor of the journey, journey through life. Um, uh, we are to a great extent unaware of uh, our philosophical assumptions. One of the major challenges is any, of anyone who wishes to examine life in depth is to begin to be aware of the unexamined philosophical assumptions. Uh, your assumptions, the assumptions of your society, of your culture. Uh, we, for better or worse, are given a tremendous legacy. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with companies uh, as a consultant and uh, um, I'm quite critical of uh, information technology and I use it but uh, uh, it's, it's uh, a metaphor for life and maybe we'll touch on that shortly but uh, one of the big problems with these organizations is uh, they have a computer system and they uh, are purchased by another company that has a computer system and they don't talk to each other. It's a legacy problem. And a great deal of the problem we have communicating with, with each other, understanding our own lives is a legacy problem. So we need to be more aware of those assumptions about life, about the way things are, that uh, we inherit when we're born. Uh, I find myself constantly reflecting and uh, trying to draw upon not only my personal experience but the full range of, of people that I dialogue with. And these are people that are living and people that uh, I know. These are people that have written books that I, I value, people that have died centuries ago, but I keep going back to them to dialogue. Um, and often when I begin to think about something, something comes in my mind and I try to relate it to my personal experience and when the subject of, of responsibility, freedom, and justice came up, um, I found myself reflecting on responsibility um, and justice. The two things that th came up to my mind right away was was uh, justice. Uh, I'm aware I've worked uh, uh, trying to change social structures and it's, it's this power struggle and there's power there. And I've often been in circumstances where myself and the people I'm working with had very little power. And I know what it's like to be crushed. Uh, you know. um, so I find myself reflecting on that. And uh, responsibility and, and in my reflections it, it struck me that often we exercise the greatest personal responsibility in our lives when we've been crushed when we're most powerless and I thought of this book Tuesday with Maury I read this book on a flight to Asia and it brings up emotions because my father was dying at the time Maury, uh, if you read the book, they've also made a movie out of it, uh, had ALS. Uh, it's a degenerative disease, kind of starts down at your toes and works its way up, and by the time it, it as Maury said, uh, I have to prepare for the day when they're going to wipe my butt. And uh, what I remembered about Maury that was so impressive is that as he lost all of his power, he took 
tremendous responsibility for his life. He's, you could see that he decided how his life was going to be, what the meaning of it was. He took full responsibility, even though he couldn't move an arm, couldn't wipe his own butt, couldn't feed himself. And everyone around him were, were powerfully moved. Uh, and he left the legacy that I think will continue to influence people. And uh, right away, that's a paradox. It's right away a paradox. So I, I want to talk today about one of the, the main issues is existential wisdom. And I define existential wisdom as sp coming from the realization that life is a paradox, that it's ambiguous, that it's a predicament. Um, and wisdom, any of you have thought about wisdom, we know it's not just intelligence. We've all had, we've known people who are smarter than anything have, you know, but they are the stupidest people you've ever seen, <laughs> you know? Um, I had a professor, <laughs> I remember, I mean, a philosophy professor in college that literally would, would be walking down the hall and walk into a closet because he took the wrong door and we'd wait there and he wouldn't come out. <laughs> and we'd wait and then finally he'd walk out. I mean, he was really spacey. Um, we know that, that power doesn't make you wise. Uh, you know, it's just more, it's so much more, and it's almost hard to describe. But I feel that if we can come to a full understanding, experientially, uh, intellectually, emotionally, uh, that life is a paradox. It's full of contradictions. Uh, it's a predicament. And maybe uh, uh, there's two ways that I want to bring this over. And I think it will take us back to gaining some understanding of responsibility. But I, I put this up here today because I want to very, uh, with you, if we had more time, I'd have you do it yourself and then we'd compare. But a, a map of the human condition. See, I identify myself as an existential psychologist. And a lot of times people, what the heck is an existential psychologist? And you just maybe heard a talk on Sartre. And if Sartre is one, you know, and Kierkegaard is another, Buber, Levia, you know, these are all existential thinkers, existential psychologists. But are they the same? No, no. So we are always, what the heck is an existentialist? Uh huh. And of course, you know, worked by um, the most active website. Mm hmm. And the meaning website. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, that's where I'm at. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, and you were here, you know, so uh, if the, yeah. <laughs> Well, you can start your own website next week and be number three. <laughs> uh, but one way of, of, of understanding the ex what existential psychology is, is that we basically posit that psychology, the other human sciences, um, need to be based upon an understanding of what it means to be a human being. Uh, now we're, that, now we're in trouble. <laughs> uh, but I found that one of the ways to begin to understand what it means to be a human being is kind of do a map of the human condition. Um, my thinking, is, I pull together all kinds of things, and I find that when I try to put them together, I have lots of loose ends. So I turn to making maps. And whenever I get two or three or four pieces to fit together, I find I still got five. So I rearrange them, you know, and uh, uh, I get more insights. But I keep going back to these maps and trying to, to get a sense how things flow together. So what I want to do is work on a map. And out of, as we reflect on this, 
maybe we will better understand what these paradoxes are, what the ambiguity is. We'll better understand uh, something about responsibility. We'll better understand uh, some of the questions that we, we are dealing with, struggling with right now. Uh, and if, please, uh, one of the nice things about this is that uh, I expect people to throw something out on the map. You say, well, that, you missed one turn in the road. Uh, better put that in. Uh, and the next time I do this map, it might be a little different. Um, now, I'll sh share this with you at the end, but let me just, one of the first things that uh, we're aware of is that as a person, and uh, I am one of the worst artists you'll ever find, uh, I think there's a, I, I have these wonderful images in my mind, but when I actually try to draw them, there's no resemblance whatsoever. But the first thing is, here we are. I'm a, a human being, and I find myself thrown into this life. You know, born in the south side of Chicago in an Irish family, the second, first uh, eldest of how many brothers? Four brothers. Uh, my father is from Brooklyn. I'm white. I'm male. You know, I've got this. I have been there. I am. I'm, you know, and uh, well, where did I come from? You know, well, the one thing I know is that I'm kind of aware that I'm here. Uh, so we were thrown in there. Now, I've traveled the world. I've been with people in every culture you can imagine, and different. And they were thrown into that situation. What would my life have been like if I was thrown into China, in some little village, uh, with no electricity? What would I have been like if I was born a woman? In, my wife is Singaporean Malay. She's Muslim. What was I if I was born a, wo wo a woman in a, in a Muslim country? how different things would be. So we find ourselves thrown in there. So that's the, kind of the first f fact. And we are consciously aware. So, but I put aware, awareness there because Awareness, we, before anything happens, we're already relating with life, you know, or it's going on. And, you know, there is some meaning to this. You know, how many of you talk to your babies in the, when they're in the belly? I was talking to my son. Hello in there. How you doing? You know, uh, I didn't do it because the books say it's a good idea. It just seemed natural, <laughs> you know. Uh, particularly when my wife woke me up in the middle of the night. Are you awake? Are you awake? You know, and then when I went to work, she'd fall asleep again. But I was talking to my son. But we are aware. And you, we all had that experience, driving a car, thinking about something, turning, doing all kinds of things. So our awareness, then we become conscious of it. But this is a basic, another one of those things that we're aware. We're conscious and we're aware that I'm here. All right? Uh, now, I said earlier about these philosophical, or this philosophical and conscious. Um, what the heck is consciousness? You know, we've got some very strange concepts of what this thing is. Uh, had a discussion with somebody recently who was pushing functionalism. Now, anybody, have you ever heard of functionalism? It's one of the theories of consciousness that they like to use when they talk about computers and all that. And it basically says that your brain operates like a computer in the sense that it manipulates symbols. Now, the symbols don't have to have meaning. Now, this is relevant to us, you know. So I could put, you know, you could learn the symbols of Chinese, Chinese language, and you would know Chinese. Just like a computer who only manipulates symbols, zero and one. The Boolean, you know, zero, one, zero, one. It manipulates those. And those can make up all kinds of different meaning. And they say that's the way the brain runs. Well, give me a break, you know. But uh, we have all kinds of strange ideas. What consciousness is, what awareness is. Now, as uh, an existentialist, 
uh, we look at phenomenology. Uh, I mean, what is the, the basic experience of consciousness, basic is experience of awareness? Let's go back to that. And what we find is that, and this is kind of the philosophical way of putting it, we have a subject, we have intention, and we have object, the world. All right, now the metaphor they use. Remember I said earlier about metaphors, we basically talk about existence, because we, you know, we're, it's reflective. We have existence, we want to talk about it. It's more than, uh, we use metaphors. So what is a good metaphor for this? You, have a ma you know what a magnet is? You have a negative and a positive pole. And what happens when a negative and positive pole comes together? You have a magnet. Uh, you always, is the negative the same as the positive? No. Is it the same as, as the magnet? No. But they're together, but they're different. So it's a metaphor that helps to see that the subjective and the, the world that's given to me and the, my intention, my will, the way I organize and all that, this makes up consciousness. But these elements aren't all the same. Now, I can't go into a whole discourse on this, but what I'm saying is that when we look at the human condition, this is really fundamental. It's really fundamental. And I, increasingly, I feel that our society needs to get back to this basic understanding. So what do we have? If we look at these, these uh, unconscious uh, philosophical assumptions, and even Sartre, I studied Sartre, if you were just over there, and I came to the conclusion after spending a lot of time with Sartre that he was still a monist, that he was still Cartesian. There was a, this, this split between them, and... Uh, uh, he, he could be aware of himself, he could know himself, nobody else could know me, and I can never really know anyway. Very different from your, your, your uh, philosopher Levias. Le, Le, did I say the name properly? Levinas, good. I'm glad I got it wrong. Um, <laughs> but Levinas, very different. A very different assumption. Boy, this, if we go back to this, things really change. But this is, is, is one of them. Now, uh, what else comes out here? Sense of being. Now we're starting to get, uh, as existential, we say, you know, what it really comes down to is my awareness, my consciousness of being this person that's been thrown there, being alive. All right. Now, what's the, this is where we start to start to get into some interesting things. If I have a sense of being, I have a sense of a life, and what do I have a sense of? Death. All right. Uh, my son, who's nine and a half, but he, he's already aware of death. He's already aware of it. He's aware of grandpa died. He's aware of it. Uh, we start to have the sense of life and death. All right, now, Whoa. I want to live, I don't want to die, but I become afraid of living, and there's a, you know, and all kinds of things start to happen. Existentialists love this. But something else is going on at this time. Right from the very beginning, I find myself being included into a kind of a social culture. I've had the opportunity to observe a lot of different cultures, and you can see that the way children are handled is different. And some of the, uh, I've had a lot of fun c counseling uh, couples from different companies, mixed culture couples, cross-cultural couples. And uh, they get into all kinds of, of, of uh, conflict over how you should handle a baby, just even changing the diapers, how you should do that, whether you should even have diapers, you know, and how to clean. I'm very aware of that in our culture, you know. The Malay Muslims are very clean. Let me tell you, you got to wash. You got to wash this, you got to wash that, you got to wash that. But, it, but right away, right from the beginning. But here are two other things. And this is related to our consciousness and awareness. 
I, I call it the drive toward reality and an orientative drive. Right from the very beginning, human beings like to order their environment, they like to have purpose, they like to have meaning. Now, to, if you're born into a culture, you're given it. You know? uh, but even if you're not given it, you're creating it. All right? But we also have this drive toward reality. A very simple thing. My son, we told him about Santa Claus and all that. He did his own thinking. He says, give me a break, Dad. Your mom and dad are the ones that give us the present. <laughs> you know? He saw right through it. Not everybody does, but he did. Now, a, an example of the, the orientative drive and the, the drive toward reality, it, it, we have lots of them now, actually. If you're sitting, you know, if, let's say you were born at a time where the, they told you, right, the world is flat. It's flat. This is the way it is. If you go too far, you fall off. Don't go there, you know. Uh, God said it's that way. The world is flat. He created it. He's out there. Boom, that's the way it is. But you're sitting there on the beach one day, and you see a ship going out, and it drops over the horizon. And you go, wait a minute here. If, if that's flat, I shouldn't see it that way. And then you see the sun go down. And then you're really curious, and you get a little ball, and you sit there, and you, start, and you say, give me a break. Who ever said this was flat? That's the drive toward reality. You know? So... Uh, I remember the drive toward my, my mother was uh, uh, German-Irish, and I thought that there was only one vegetable when I was a kid, and that was overboiled spinach, because no matter what vegetable my mother got, it all ended up looking like overboiled spinach, and I didn't like overboiled spinach, and uh, they would tell you, it's good for you. And my orientative, my drive toward reality said, I hate this stuff. How can something that tastes so bad, that looks so bad, be good for me? You know? Uh, but right away, you know, but what happens? The fear of death, you know? Uh, we start to say, well, this is, this is good. I want to hold on to this. I want to absorb that. I want to belong to my society. All right? But this may be stronger or weaker. Uh, now we start to understand a lot of things. We understood back, way back in the time of the Greeks, they understood this. But you know the Greeks, they were very religious. They loved this part of life. So although they had a very detailed analysis of the world, and here we could throw in another one, the infinite, and this one I know my colleague Kirk loves, and the finite, all right, that this comes through. See, now, what the drive toward reality starts to, to point out to us is this. The orientative drive wants to make things finite, clear purpose, clear order, clear meaning. And we need those things. Now, the Greeks loved this. So even though they understood the infinite and the drive toward reality, they already had people telling them that, you know, there's always more. And it's in drive, it's in flux, you know. They knew this. They were, see, in those days, the guys that were smart read everything. And they had the chance to talk to these guys. But they loved the orientative drive, so they created this platonic worldview. All right? In your own life, have you, you experienced the pull between this drive, this drive to order and meaning and kind of just being open to reality? Do you have any, any experience of that? Well, yeah, I, I hope not. I hope there's something I haven't experienced. I want more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. 
Okay, hold, hold on to hope, because we'll try to see where it fits in here. Hold on to hope. Now, now as, as our map starts to fill out a little, um, let's throw in a little something else about this consciousness, awareness, and all that. We have, uh, this is, I borrowed this from Kirk. He likes to use restrictive and expansive uh, is one way. What, what we're talking about is this consciousness. Right away, we, we begin, if we kind of have a feel for this orientative drive, the drive toward reality, we already have a sense of this restriction expansion. See, to, to exist with some equilibrium, to exist uh, and work through our days and all that, we need to repress awareness. This is, this is something that any depth psychologist begins to encounter. Uh, if we spend any time reflecting on ourselves, is that some things we allow ourselves to be conscious of and some things we don't. And this is kind of how we manage our lives. So we start to deal with this, that consciousness, we restrict it and we expand it. Now, if we overexpand it, you know, we, our orientation goes haywire and we're overwhelmed by the infinite. All right, we're overwhelmed by too much stimuli. We're overwhelmed by too much possibility. So we can put possibility here. Right there. All right, and down here by the finite, finite we, we might uh, put a little reality as we know it. Now, what is this reality? Now, we start to, we start to see how our map. What is reality? If we go with our culture that basically says the only thing that's reality is the world in itself, all right, uh, then what is reality? Reality is the material things, sensations. That's, that's, all, that's big in our culture, all right? But if we don't buy into that, what is reality? Reality is not something itself. Reality is what we are conscious of. We're in there, the subject, and our, you know, this intentional leap. Then reality isn't just material. Now something's starting to happen, all right? What is real is what we experience, all right? Not just the material world. Boy, this opens up a lot. Suddenly the, uh, you know, the cork is off the bottle and things are starting to flow. All right? Uh, but we, you know, then it, it might overwhelm us. So we're, we're starting to see back to this how life and you know, going back to death, you know, this is you know, what Kirk in his talk talked about all. You know, and we're drawn to it. And at the same time, uh, we, we, we pull away from it because it scares us. Um, you'll find if you read existential writers, they reflect both. Um, on the one hand, they say we have to open up to this infinite. Uh, the other time, it's going to scare the hell out of us. Um, and then we also know that we have to kind of make choices, like freedom. Let's talk about freedom. In our culture right now, we like to say, they like to preach you know, unlimited possibilities. Have you heard anybody preach that? You can be anything. Life, there's no limits. You are free to be anything, but they don't tell you that once you exercise your freedom, you're finite, right? I've got all these choices, do this, do that. But once I exercise my freedom, I've limited it. I've made myself finite. So based on my understanding of the human condition, when people tell me I, everything is possible, I say, yeah, but that's half the truth. But they succeed, they're popular, because they preach half the truth. And that's another thing I've come to realize. If you give people half the picture, uh, you know, it makes them more comfortable. When you give them the whole picture, you know, uh, well, maybe it's, it's, hey, that doesn't make me p perfectly comfortable. And this issue about being comfortable, it's about time we start to throw in there something called anxiety. Now what the heck is anxiety? It starts to get on our map and all kinds, of, I could put it over here. Anxiety is kind of, a, it's, it's like if you travel along the road, you get a, a, a you know, one of these uh, 
signs. This is anxiety, you know. <laughs> you know? Uh, but what happens if I'm consciously aware of life? I'm consciously aware of death. All right. If I'm aware of wow, all this possibility, and I have to make a choice, I get anxious. Let's look at a choice. I was listening to the radio. Uh, and we can, now we start to get in predicaments. I was listening to the radio, and uh, this was after September 11th, and they were discussing uh, ethics, uh, and, 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 and uh, Enron was going on too, and the guy, it's, they were basically, the guy they had on the radio was saying that it's a biological thing, that you do the right thing because it's programmed into your genes. So he, and he gave the example, if you came to a, 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 a lake and you saw a little kid drowning, you, would, you know, would right away jump in and save the kid because you're, you know, you're biologic programmed to save the infant. And I, I didn't have a phone. I practically ran off the road. And I said, what a crock, you know? I said, the real, real ethical problem is if you get there to the lake and there are two kids drowning. And you can only save one. Who are you going to save? And no matter who you save, what are you going to feel? Shit. Yes. And it can get even more complex. There's two kids. One's closer in. There's one kid farther out. The kid further out drowning is your own kid. What are you going to do? You know? Ethical questions are rarely logical, rarely just biological, you know? Uh, there are predicaments. You've got two values. You're in Bosnia. You're a representative of a drug company. You, you know, the, the local a aid association wants to have some drugs to save people from dying. All right? Your company has a policy. No bribery. No kickbacks. Nothing. But you know the only way to get those drugs from Romania into Bosnia is that they're going to have to, the truck drivers are going to have to have a, a, a a box full of cash and every time they're stopped by the local militia they have to pay somebody off and if they don't pay them off they may be taken out and have a bullet put in their head you follow your company rules or do you pay the bribe what do you do all right you know life this starts where we get the predicaments all right let's go on let's add something else all right we are we know we, we get into our social cultural thing, but this is the automatic life. We existentialists talk about having an authentic existence. And what that really means, let's put it over here, being an individual. We got another one of these. Now this, this let's put community over here. You know those old stories about the kid being raised by wolves? Don't believe them. <laughs> you know, if, we, if we're going to, this is the big problem in Africa. I was just talking to uh, one of our colleagues out there. He's going to be going to Afro South Africa uh, on Monday. And, and uh, about 30, in some places, 40% uh, of the adults have AIDS. How many of those, their children will be orphans? How can those kids thrive and live and survive without parents, without a, a stable st social structure? Very difficult. Uh, so we know we need community. We need this. But the difficulty is this social structure is just an orientated drive. And it, 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 it is what it is because it cuts out a lot of this. Yet we have an awareness of, of more possibility. You know? All right, now we can deal with this by just towing the line, and, and really most people kind of get through life by just getting absorbed in this social, cultural structure, and it's nice, if it works, it's wonderful, they don't have to think too much, they don't have to exercise responsibility, don't have to make many choices. Have you known anybody who's done that? You know, that pretty, pretty much tells you where you are. Japanese, or Chinese, Japanese, Japanese society. You know, where you go to school, boom, 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 your life is planned. They have a, a, a new human being in Japan right now, the young people. 
because that f old formula ain't working anymore, <laughs> you know. And suddenly there's a lot of anxiety over there because a lot of people who, you know, who could just fit into the social cultural structure, the whole life was planned, everything was mapped out, decided for you, suddenly this isn't working anymore. They've got a big dose of reality coming in. I've learned that if a culture is really going to change, you need, in some form or another, an external influence coming in. You know, uh, the Asia, most of those cultures didn't really start to really burst out of their tradition until, I mean, it, it's again, it's one of the paradoxes of life. If it wasn't for the influx of the Westerners, China would still be doing what it would, had done for centuries with no impetus to change. Okay, the Guaylo, the, the Western devils, they came in, they caused all this trouble. All right, and this is related to this interpersonal encounter that you love, you know. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So they threw some, you know, wrenches into our machinery. This is the, the, the drive to reality interferes, and it can interfere at any time. And that's why this path toward individuality is related to the anxiety, a feeling of being lost, some type of crisis, and it can hit you at any time. And it says, you're going to have to start to take responsibility for what's going on in your life. The crisis could be the death of a parent. The crisis could be going to another country. I mean, I, I, gee, it hit me pretty early in life. I started to travel. I was born Roman Catholic, Irish Catholic family, and uh, life was fully explained, you know. But I, well, I read Augustine. Oh, that gives me an example of the finite and the infinite. You know, the, the story Augustine tells about sitting on, the, on the, the Mediterranean, the beach in the Mediterranean, and he saw a little kid dug a hole in the sand, and then he had a little little ladle, and he was running over to the, the ocean, picking up some water, running back to the, pouring it in. And he was doing this, and he was doing it about 15, 20 minutes, and Augustine got a little curious. He says, what is this kid doing? He went over, he said, kid, what are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to put the ocean in the hole. And Augustine, who was trying to figure out, the, he, you know, he came from the Platonic tradition. He thought and one of the, the things of the Platonic tradition is that the, all the world could be reduced to a mathematical formula. You know? They had that assumption. And Augustine had that assumption that all of life could be explained. And he suddenly hit him, that's bull. It can't be explained. Life is infinite. And that, you know, now start to think. Do you have any examples of things that have made you aware that life is so much more than what you think? And then it starts to get the anxiety. And then you start to question your social culture. Well, once that starts to happen, all right, either you go with it or you start to become pretty neurotic. And this, is the, this brings out the understanding, the existential understanding of what neurosis is. It, it, well, that tells us something else. What we learn with consciousness is that the, one of the first things human beings do is lie to themselves. We're the only creatures that lie. Mark Twain likes to say that. All right, so we're aware of so much, we lie, we repress it, and that's how we live. But when we start to be, uh, you know, we start to lie to ourselves, we start to cause our neurosis. And one ex existential ex explanation of neurosis is that, that in order to avoid the real problems, life as a predicament, the anxiety, the choices, the freedom, and all that, we uh, repress those things and we create other problems for ourselves. So I have all this anxiety, but if I can turn it into a specific fear, then I can manage it. All right? So I, I don't step on the lines. I am tremendous, what's your experience? But I, I am tremendously surprised at how many people have phobias of some type. You know, it's really surprising. But we take all these little fears and we make them manageable. All right, so the process toward individual authenticity is this begins with feeling lost, crisis. Something doesn't fit here, and we start to work on it. Have you started that path? 
once I started to travel internationally, once I started to read theology, once I started to read more literature, I started, I found I was on that path and I, can't, I couldn't go back. Now, I've worked with people in therapy who, who knew what I knew, but they went back. Have you ever had people like that? You know, they, they are much more aware of what life is really about, but they're play acting that it was still the good old Roman Catholic or, you know, mama said, and they know differently. You know, we do so much harm to ourselves when we try to be that which we know we're not. Um, okay, so now, Sartre and a lot of the existentialists say that uh, the real path toward authenticity was this individual, you know, path of alienation and isolation. That if you want to be a, an authentic self, how many people like Clint Eastwood movies? You watch Clint Eastwood? You ever watch Clint Eastwood? You know? What's the storyline there all the time? The isolated, lonely cowboy. This is the cowboy, the American cowboy myth. In order to maintain his integrity, his authenticity, he can't participate in culture and society. He's always on the periphery. And when that culture is in trouble, he will suddenly, suddenly he's there on his horse with his gun. And he comes in, he solves the problem, but he has to leave again. This is the 19th century myth that in order to be an authentic person, you had to isolate yourself from culture. You had to break away. And it's only through self-inner exploration that you came to an authentic existence. And it's still very powerful in our culture. You know, um, and a lot of this is what a lot of uh, therapy focuses on. You know, you, you do your own work. You can find yourself in yourself. Oh, that brings us up this whole self. How many people have found them saying um, you have to find your true self, discover yourself? What do you do? Is there some self to be found? What do you think? <laughs> there is this, this process of consciousness going on. Is there this, you know, self? Yes and no. Yes and no. no. That I am a unique center of consciousness. Okay, what's this encapsulated ego? Have you ever de dealt with that one in your philosophy courses? The encapsulated ego? Where do we Westerners, and this is maybe different from Japan, if a, a Westerner points to himself, where does he point? Me. You know, or we may go to the heart because we're in emotions. In Asia, they often go here. You know, this is the hara, the, the center. And this is where life comes from. But, if you look at a conscious experience, you know, is consciousness just stuck within my body? Is it, does it end with my body, consciousness? No, not you. Mm hmm Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, okay, we throw in the, the body and over here spirit, or that which is not just pure, you know. Um, now, if you look at the map, what we're getting, uh, we're starting to see a lot of these paradoxes, things that don't fit together. And I was thinking of paradoxes um, yesterday at your lecture. You know, it hit me. Predicament, paradox. The unique, in incomprehensible other. And then you went on, you know, I said, yeah, okay, I take that. Then in the next few sentences you're saying, and then we know this unique person. And we're related. And I said, wait a minute, can you be both? Yes. The person is totally other, but also so intimate and close. 
And that's, that's what drives you crazy if you're married, you know? You know this person, you're so darn close, and then the next second, wow, they're infinitely other. Who is this person? All right? And that's a predicament. Do we ever really get to know somebody? You know? Just when we think we do, they change on us. Then we have another problem. This is where I think community, this issue of community and interpersonal relations. We look at our existential, our human condition. All right, I go on this path of self-discovery, of really being authentic, taking responsibility for myself, creating my own life. And I realize that as an individual, I can't sustain it. I can create it, but I can't keep it alive. I need other people. I need somebody to say, I am me. Not to say, you know, uh, you've got to do what I want, you've got to be this. And this is kind of what we call the encounter, the love. So I come out of this authentic search and I say, here I am. What's the word? Hanini. Hanini, here I am. And somebody says, fuck you. <laughs> you know, we don't want you. <laughs> you know, you know, there I go. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have to be honest. I need somebody to stay. So if I engage you in a, and you come back and affirm me in a loving relationship, acknowledge me, and say, I don't completely understand you, but you are who you are, and I get that affirmation, I can continue to be an authentic person. What's happening in your life? What's going on? But don't we do that in our culture? Now this gets back to this responsibility. Uh, or this uh, another issue. We create something. Well, you see, this social cultural thing, what we forget is that it comes from us. You know, because we don't know the world and stuff. Now, we have lots of, of philosophical assumptions about this. That very quickly, it, we started off with the belief that God was out there, the great watchmaker, the great creator, and he said, Let there be light. And it's going to be this way. And there's going to be the Mediterranean. We got the Pacific. And we laid it all out. And somebody got the message and wrote it down. And there it is. So, well, we, you know, people believed that for a while. And then they started to say, well, you know, this doesn't match up. There's lots of discrepancies. Even when you start to read the scriptures, if anybody, you know, religious, but this is a bit, one of the big awakenings of, of people who kind of love the Bible. When you start to get into historical analysis and you realize things that were written and put together were written three or four hundred years apart. And how do they know? Well, so this is vocabulary they didn't have until the Assyrians were around. Or this is, is obviously Greek philosophy. And they didn't have that 2,000 you know, years ago. And, whoa, boy, what's going on with this thing? And you start to realize that's the old drive, reality drive, that, you know, hey, you know, it's not exactly as they say. It's more metaphorical. Oh, boy. But you get the fact that we're the ones who created all this. And then, oh, boy, this is your meaning is going to go. This is the encounter with nothingness. Oh, my God, what a predicament. But can we live without that? Uh, Otto Rock says that, you, you know, you discover that, you, you, you know, life is an illusion, but at the same time you realize it, that you need that illusion to live. It's a predicament. <laughs> you know? All right, I got this illusion, but I, I know it's, it's, it's only maybe one possibility, one way to look at it. See, we often think illusion means it's not real. But if we go back to our understanding of a consciousness, if I experience it as real as anything... You know, that's the strange thing. What is the real? If, is it just material? Is it just the spiritual? You know, uh, what we experience. That's why phenomenologists say we got to go back to what we experience. You know, that's a radical empiricism. Uh, a few more elements in here. Uh, oh, we could add doubt here again. I, I, I'm very aware that 
you know, you make something your own, you got to doubt it. Isn't this, this thing, I'm told that this is, is, is the way to do things. It's only when I doubt it that I can make it my own, to make it really personal. All right. Do you believe this? Oh, my dad said so. My mom said so. The president said so. But until you've doubted it and really examined it, and that's responsibility. There it comes out again. You know? Uh, now, let's see. Throw in anything. Uncertainty. So we get this uncertainty here. Let's put in, we, we talked about Gandhi the first night. Why did Gandhi so adamantly affirm diversity? Because he knew finite and the infinite. We are finite beings considering the infinite. So what? We only have a partial understanding of it. You know, you only have a partial understanding of it. He said, diversity is an obvious fact of life. And if we don't accept it, we are negating life. And that's why I said, if any of you were at that, that uh, presentation you know, on nonviolence, I said that uh, the nonviolence is a real deep appreciation of the human condition. If I only have a, a, a one view of it, if I understand this uh, consciousness in this sense, uh, I add another thing here. Dialogue becomes so important. Because I know that my grasp of truth is only partial. The only way we have any of this is through agreement. So all kinds of things start to happen, and time is running out. Um, but what I'm sharing now, we, this is where we start to see how responsible we are. We see we're responsible for this. Huh? That ultimately what we have it comes from us. But we project our power, and I get back to that issue of power. We project our power onto this, and in order for it to sustain us and keep us from feeling the anxiety and the fear of death and all these predicaments, we consider this to be independent of us. So we create technology, we create feng shui, we create all kinds of systems and invest our power in it, and those systems then begin to tell us how to live. But what we realize is that we're the one who created all those. We're responsible for that. So we come back to why do we constantly talk about freedom and responsibility? Why do we say life is a predicament? All of these things start to bubble up. And then we start to get existential wisdom. You know? And that is, so if somebody comes up and you say, you can be anything. My existential wisdom says, hey, wait a minute now. You know? Or if somebody says, you are totally responsible for yourself. My existential wisdom, hey, give me a break. You know? And then we start to see things so much clearer. And a lot of the garbage that is thrown out at us, academically, you know, conventional wisdom and all this stuff, we start to say, wait a minute. Just this morning, I saw a little of the news, and they had a little banner at the bottom. New gene study identifies the gene for anxiety. I, I have existential wisdom. I say, give me a break. You also, if you study, you know, you have some experimental, you know that correlation doesn't mean cause and effect. And if you realize that everything is interrelated, this is, in a, you know, then you realize that basically cause and effect belongs to this social cultural assumption. That, you know, really... The basic experience is an unilinear. We, and if you have this, you know that it's all interacting. So this whole linear cause-effect study goes out. And you see it as a construct of our social culture. Wow, now you really are a critical thinker. You, your experience is broadened. We, and then we realize that life is a predicament. We're taking stands. It's fluid. And I'm humble. Because I know that, boy, I only got one take on this. And I dialogue. I know I need other people. And I'm gratitude. And all of the things that we've been talking about for the last several days suddenly start to, you know, come into place. And make your map, you know, uh, 
if you're interested in this, you add to it because I'm sure it's not complete, you know. And as you go continue, you know, you throw things in there and you'll be surprised that you start to be more creative in your work, in your relationships. Uh, it's not safer. <laughs> it's not safer. <laughs> But uh, any questions in that? We, uh, we, 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 nobody's coming in here right now, I don't think. So. Thank you, George. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Now, I, I share with you, I, what I do is I write down things that people say, and I have, see, I, 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 I get organized at times, and at times I'm just so overwhelmed by so many things. But, you know, that which we create lacks the power to, to sustain us, so we project our orientation onto the world. And with responsibility and power, we give away so much of our power. Well, please. Yeah, please. Oh, I take different sources from phenomenology. Uh, I'm not familiar with that specific, but there is a number of people who have written some really beautiful and more comprehensive explorations of consciousness. Oh, conscious awareness? No, but it's there. I mean, that's a, a, one of the distinctions. I'm not familiar with that book. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think if you if you, you do a study of co consciousness, and and start to get a grasp of this, it'll make a big it. It's a big shift. It's a big shift. Yeah. Yeah. That's a predicament. You know. That's a predicament. But, we, uh, but then if you go social culture, there are uh, social cultures also to the Yeah. See, that's the predicament of the individual and, and the community. Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, should we, you know, should I separate myself to, to achieve some integrity? You know, and we have all kinds of, of psychological theories that, that say, you know, you're being formed and, and made, you know, you're a woman. You're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. You know, society's telling us. You know, there's all kinds of the pressure. It becomes, you know, but once I've separated myself, I know I've got to come back and deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another thing, infinite, finite. We find that I could add change up here and all that. So this is my effort to kind of, uh, maybe this will be a, a tool you can use to reflect over your experience over the last several days and start to pull things together. Um, and, but it ends with a Chinese saying, you know. Uh, there's two, it's a Taoist saying. One is ji jie bat yin, knower, if you really know, you don't say. You know, yin jie bat ji, the guy who talks doesn't know. And it brings out that, you know, that's the predicament. We, we, we never really... And they also have one that do ho do fei shen do. You know, that if you say it's the way, it's not the way. And it's a reflection of, you know, this is so fluid. And Kirk talks about the fluid center. But you see how fluid and how all these things are interacting. You know, but it, it suddenly, it, it's a re, you know, our intellectual life, our emotional, our relationship, you know, if we have that existential wisdom, uh, we may not be able to give people answers, but we sure as heck know what's bull, you know. And we have a lot, we see the possibilities, and, and we, we can go with the flow and influence it, accept the influence, know what is important in a particular situation, what is not important. Yeah. Now, Kirk has is, is written a lot about this, this expansive state. Um, 
that drunken carnival, you know. Um, and most people who have meditated themselves in the expansive, I mean, what do they say? Buddha did it, didn't do it alone. He was under a tree with his disciples. And, and the tradition of, of meditation usually puts you in a situation where people are around you to kind of help you. And, and if you've done any, read any of the stuff on the LSD thing that was big, you know, you wouldn't know anything about that. Yeah. But the LSD, uh, you know, they basically, the conclusion of those studies was that it, it could be a very positive experience if it was done in the right environment with people there to protect you. But if, if you didn't have those people, you might, you know, get so expansive, you jump and you're flying. Except your body doesn't fly, your spirit does. <laughs> uh, does this relate to any of your work? I mean, does this bring out something in your work? Or do you add to this? Yeah, and, and, and well, you'll find, uh, uh, you know, the Buddhism definitely brings out a lot of these elements, you know, and and they 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 I think Buddhism would say life is a predicament, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, joy, where, joy. What do, you, what do you think? What do you think? I, I, my own reflection is I find this helpful when I work with people because I see all the, the, the things that may be going on. And, and I, I, don't, I don't approach things just head on. And I find myself working with one, one part of the map and I know that it will flip right over to the other side. See, I find that this has helped me a lot with understanding people that in the sense that, you know, if they really spend a lot of time talking about their alienation and isolation, I know that inevitably we're going to get back to this. And my understanding of therapy is, is I need to be prepared for the interpersonal encounter. If they've gone into the depths of isolation and alienation, they're going to need me to affirm them, need me to reconnect them to community, and I, that's my commitment to be available for that. If they're, you know... Uh, too expansive and all that, sometimes I just ask, what have you learned from that? How can you bring that back into your daily life that helps them be a little more grounded? But I'm aware, you know, and then...
But I, I, I find myself flipping it over uh, until I kind of check with people. I, I find uh, as a person and, and, and uh, organizations to societies that if you, you want to you know yourself, get some feedback in a way. But I have to be open and have to accept it. I mean, uh, then that, that gives me some wisdom that if you really want to give a client feedback, sometimes I, I ask, would you like this, uh, you know? Because I know that, yeah, probably people have the best insights into me, but if I'm not open to it, so I have to do my work being open to it, and then someone can give it to me. And I think uh, I found that most organizations are unwilling to go, you know, they always ask, you know, do, as a, a consultant to organizations, they like to do visions and mission statements and value statements. And I find most of it is just bull. Because um, you, you know th this is what they think they are, but if they go and ask their customers, if they ask their staff, they find out they get a whole different list. I was one organization. We care for staff, and I kept saying that's bull. You just want to make money, uh, you know, and you could look at your behavior, right? You know, um, you know, you want to make money, you know, and you the thing you pride yourself in most is how much you make. Don't give me this, you know, we, we serve with the heart and all this crap, you know. But, well, they didn't want to hear that. And I lost that one. Uh, but, um, but it was obvious, you know. And it, they started to, they do with, you know, cut people, do whatever to. But, um, see, that's where I find myself flipping it around. That's right, and this is right. And, 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 and working with that. Uh, and I've... What do you think? What do you think? Is there? You, you, you're asking the question. Well, what's your sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I think I demonstrate my bias when I say existential wisdom and not five guidelines for a better life. Uh, or, you know, uh, six steps to, uh, f you know, seven, okay, seven <laughs> steps to a fulfilled. Um, so and you say it's part of that sense of being, yeah, yeah I think so. so That's the whole path of Zen, Japanese Zen and all that. The guy goes off and he spends six years trying to get the Zen master to tell him the answer. Every time he comes, he says, go away, meditate, for, for, you know, and then come back. And the guy says, well, what's the answer? And then whack, he slaps him. You know, he says, go away and do it again. And finally, you know, after about 10 years, you know, the Japanese are stubborn, you know. <laughs> the guys. <laughs> No. Southern California. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, but, uh, but in Japan, that's the thing. I mean, I, I, looking at Zen uh, in, in Japan, the, uh, uh, it, it goes so much against the culture, but it really, and then they finally realize is that, yeah, it's within yourself, but it takes a lot of people a lot of time. 
Now in America, you know, or let's say we're in Southern California, you know, what is, what is the insight that we have to bring? That it's within ourselves. There, they tell you it's all within yourself. Everything is in you. You can be whatever. Unlimited possibilities. And we have a, a, an American culture, quite different from a Japanese culture, where pursuit of yourself, your own, you know, and it's not surprising now that uh, these Enron and all these companies are doing what they're doing because in our culture, you know, taking care of number one, we, we, we have a, 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 and that's part of that social, cultural, philosophical heritage. We, ha we what do we believe? That the best f outcome for society happens when everybody pursues their own individual interest. Are you aware that that's basically one of the, the fundamental principles of American culture? And where does that come from? Not from religion, it comes from an economic theory based upon uh, pretty much 19th century materialism. Now when we start to do, is that? But that's what drives American culture. So if you're a CEO and you have a chance to get $150 million, well, it's, you're not going to think very long. You're going to say, yeah, let's go for it, baby, you know? Uh, and, and, you know, uh, so... I think also the wisdom traditions, some of these wisdom traditions on the family now speak to the creation of your wisdom through the religious dialectics. Uh, but one of the questions is, how do we receive those wisdom Yeah. That's that anxiety. But, is, uh, that, yeah. Yeah. but paradoxically, that's the very thing that energizes the joy. Yeah. See, I go back to what we started with, the Mori. The thing that impressed people about Mori, God, that even though he, he was just uh, not, his body was fading away, that guy had more life than the people that had, you know, than CEOs and all those things. Uh, so there's... Uh,